close your blinds and light a candle with me. I'm Gishidi Six, and I'll welcome you to Third Eye. Last time, we understood that Oku needed no rescuing, were chased by a monster, and filled our logbook with every possible entry. After last episode's flashback had ended, eye drops had appeared on the counter. But once we touch them, our pursuer returns. We get a much better view on it this time. Its chest is carved out in the shape of a heart, and its head isn't connected to the neck, but to a glistening umbilical cord. Again, Koishi is struck by pedophobia. But is that really the case? Even though she says it, I don't think our protagonist is afraid of infants. I believe she's been scarred by her own infancy. We hurl the eye drops we just received at the monster. To what effect? Well, we can spy on another conversation. We have no idea where this takes place, but we can deduce who takes part in it. Someone who's obsessed with a fault. It was the mother who was supposedly doing so badly at raising her kids, right? It sounds like she is shifting the blame and taking her frustration out on little Koishi. We have now landed somewhere completely different. There is no sign of the monstrous baby, so that's a relief. The eye drops might indeed be the weapon to fight it with. We're in a forest, and several out-of-place objects have been scattered around it. The doctor's bag and medicine cabinet we are now inspecting could usually be found just in front of our cell. In fact, all of these elements are familiar. The snow had burst into our mansion during Chirno's chapter, and we've seen the telephone booth next to Kozusu in the park. Koishi said that someone needed help. We don't know who, but out of all the options we have, only the phone might be useful. We could call 911, the police or an ambulance, but just as we pick it up, we already have a call waiting for us. They know our name. Oh no, before anything could be resolved, that uncanny horror has returned. It wastes no more time, moves in and smacks us with a meaty fist. Again, everything goes black, we can only listen. This time, Satori seems to be at the center of it all. It's not sounding like she has it too bad in the family. I believe the speaker is the father. Is he conspiring to kill Koishi? That is despicable. From what we've heard of this abusive man, it's not too big of a surprise, though. Not all mothers and fathers love their children, after all. Just as I doubted earlier. If this was, however, a look into the family's past, they must have not succeeded with the plot. Another change has taken place, now in the maternity ward. A new excerpt lies on the floor. Since we already have every single text, this is a special one. It makes the monster flatten us. It also brings us back to the living room. Only one parent is present right now, and the children are getting on its nerves. We know they don't mean anything bad. Babies just have a natural instinct to call for attention. Otherwise, they would risk getting abandoned. Whenever they say, ah, blue, I think it's when their crying lowers into a defeated, powerless whining. The parent, I think it's the mother again, is really not building up any trust with the babies. She's letting them know that they are a huge burden on her, and the main reason why the marriage is in such shambles. Something unexpected happens then. Whose fault is it? One of the twins asks. It's like it took on the mother's personality. Oh, another warp to a familiar place happened. We do know this bus stop. 
We reached it even before we saw Tay for the first time, before we spoke to anyone, really. The park bench is somehow sentient and talks to us all high and mighty, as if it's been monitoring our progress. Life is like a box of chocolates. A reference to Forrest Gump, not a horror movie for a change. Forrest is indeed someone Koishi could look up to as a role model. Flawed for sure, but functioning against all odds. The park bench recommends we inspect the box of life chocolates sitting on it. We shall do that in due time, but not before we've given the area a third eye scan. It doesn't reveal much, other than that the trees here could also be arteries. The bench sounded rather ominous about its gift. Can we actually trust it? Scissors? And they're not of the child safe variety. I'm unsure if it's wise to give these to us. That time we found an axe, Koichi proved she is not the most trustworthy person to wield a weapon. We hear an unpleasant screech and are plunged into another scenario that we can only hear. The speaker begs us to wake up. Whoever they are, they seem to actually care about our well-being for a change. We return to reality. All these trippy visions are taking a toll on our protagonist. The scissors we received are still with us. They have the most bare bones description. Somehow, that makes me believe they are especially significant. Back outside, we inspect the creepy lamppost baby again. Before, we couldn't do much with it. Now we get a stronger reaction from it, followed by something peculiar. Two options have appeared, and how they just float in permanent text boxes really sticks out. Bury the past and write off the past. To me, those sound like the exact same thing. It might be a translation quirk. Bury the past means here that Koishi should make peace with what happened. Writing it off means she will deny her experiences and forcibly shut them out. The choice might be the most crucial one yet. So much that Koishi herself keeps second-guessing our selection. But we stay determined. After a line that slipped through translation, we use the scissors for an act of forgiveness. We cut the umbilical cord of the baby so that it can float away from the hospital, out of the neighborhood, towards a blue sky. Koishi does the same in a sense. She walks away from her trauma, out of her personal hell, towards freedom. Koishi was that baby. And with that, the credits roll. We have finished Third Eye. It was a short game, but it had a lot to say over its runtime. What you saw was the best, most satisfying of the three endings that I know of. I've experimented a lot. I don't think there are any endings that I haven't discovered yet. Look forward to the coverage of the others in a bonus episode. Anyway, what a journey this was. Before I played Third Eye for the first time, I assumed it would be a very standard horror game. I reckoned monsters would chase you, gore you, and there would be jump scares. We saw of course that it was barely that. That it was psychological horror through and through. It was also a very narrative driven game, very artistic, and with a lot of symbolism to interpret. Some people would call this kind of game a walking simulator, if they do want to use such a condescending term. But nowadays, it is possible and acceptable to make a video game that is mostly there to get a message across, even when it's really light on interactivity. So, what was that message? I have to be honest, the first time I played through Third Eye, it barely made sense to me. It 
didn't help that back then, I got the middle neutral ending, which is the most confusing of the bunch. In subsequent playthroughs, I noticed repeating patterns and themes, and was able to piece a lot of ideas together. I'm going to try and give you a core summary on what I think this game might be about. Through neglect and abuse, Koishi had developed a severe and lasting trauma in her early life. We can assume she sabotaged her parents' car to murder them in revenge. Still, this wasn't enough to free her from her horrible past. She was inching closer and closer to insanity. Satori would then give her special medication that allowed Koishi to voyage through her own dreams and combat her trauma to the point where she would hopefully resolve it. In our Let's Play, she fortunately did. This isn't the only interpretation. I've once read a theory that Satori was the real antagonist and that she abuses Koishi by forcing those nightmares on her. If you have any other thoughts on what the developer wanted to get across, don't be shy to share them in the comments or in the forum thread at Maidens of the Kaleidoscope's newest incarnation. I do enjoy discussing such weird, artsy and cryptic titles like Third Eye. We get a wavy fin, but we're not quite done we have an after credit scene to make sure you all see the next Marvel movie, if this were one of them. It is, of course, not. Koishi and Satori are now sitting together on a park bench. It is easily the most cordial moment we've seen them have with each other. We can also assume this is reality now, and that Koishi's treatment was a success. Satori makes it sound like they're running some kind of store together. There are supposedly customers arriving from the mountains, yet it's unclear at the moment what exactly is being sold. There's a mention of some sort of sweet deal. That phrasing makes it sound like an illegal activity. Let's not be so pessimistic. It is about kids. Could it be the Komejis are trying to make their mansion double as an orphanage? Maybe they're about to bring in White Tenshi and Black Sakuya. That's a crossover of fan games I'd be down for. Unfortunately, Koishi is still a little too unstable from what Satori makes it sound like. I guess the sisters are not ready to start their business just yet. With that, this story is coming to a close. I really liked what Third Eye had to offer. The puzzles were very light, but to counter that, we got some really powerful imagery, and it also made us ponder about serious and even taboo issues. Ooh, we end on a demonic smile from Koishi. It's that typical moment of horror where you think everything turned out fine, only to be asked, or did it? So, I hope you got an enjoyable time, but also some shivers and shocks, from this Let's Play most untypical for me. I'm Gishiri6, and this was Third Eye. Bis bald!